Good afternoon. Welcome to Sanctuary. So glad to have a full house here today. Um, a little housekeeping issue. Uh, if you haven't turned your phone off, please do that. Uh, and also to let you know that the flu has come to One Voice Mixed Chorus. Uh, some of the names doing readings and solos may not perfectly match your program. So just give them a big round of applause in that case. <clears throat> Minnesota, land of 10,000 plus immigrants, right? So just imagine, 200 years ago, the population of Minnesota was 6,000, 200 years ago, made up mostly of Ojibwe and Dakota people, and then a few British and French fur traders and settlers thrown in. <clears throat> but just a few years, a few decades later, in 1858, Minnesota became a state, and by that time, many more immigrants had come from the eastern seaboard, and the largest group of foreign-born immigrants were, anybody know? German, <coughs> German. So we have the Germans to thank for hot dogs and uh, potato salad and the first Minnesota brewery, uh, the Anthony Yorg Brewing Company of St. Paul. <laughs> so in that very same decade, in the mid 1800s when Minnesota became a state, across the pond, another very important German named Johannes Brahms composed a requiem. And this next movement is the centerpiece of his very beloved and enduring requiem.
January 1892. They opened Ellis Island and they let the people through. And the first to cross the threshold of the Isle of Hope and Tears was Annie Moore from Ireland, who was all of 15 years. ago, 70% of Minnesota's population was either foreign-born or had one parent who was foreign-born. Scandinavians from Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Denmark fled overpopulation and poor farming conditions in the mid-1800s and often settled in their own distinctive communities within Minnesota, maintaining their own unique food, customs, music, and dance. More Norwegians now live in Minnesota than in any other state. Krumkaka, anyone? <laughs> Ufta. Domar Danson is a Swedish folk song and game played in a circle. The judge holds a candle to light each, uh, each player's face, and the one who smiles first has to pay the mortgage. <laughs> <laughs> Lines like, if you dream of a lover in the night, we're sure to make someone smile. Thank you. 
Minnesota was a place of sanctuary on the Underground Railroad, the network of secret routes and houses that offered safe passage for fleeing slaves who followed the drinking gourd, the Big Dipper's North Star. Safety was a bit of a misnomer, however, since slave owners were generally allowed to come into Minnesota to force their property back into captivity. African Americans have lived in Minnesota since the 1800s, primarily in the Twin Cities. In the late 1800s and early 1900s, they founded churches, newspapers, community centers, and labor unions, addressing the reality that most labor unions barred blacks from membership. On January 1st, 1869, 
Minnesota became the first state in the union to extend voting rights to black men. Of course, legal rights do not always ensure equal rights. As recently as 1920, a white mob lynched three black men in Duluth. In the 1960s, St. Paul's vibrant Rondo neighborhood was destroyed, and more than 600 Afri African American residents were displaced to build Interstate 94. Racial disparities and de facto se segregation still exist today. With the drinking gourd, we honor black Minnesota leaders, past and present, who remind us that black, black lives, lives matter. matter and continue. and continue to pave the way in creating a safe and vibrant sanctuary for African Americans.
We have had an incredibly wonderful experience this fall uh, in a collaboration with uh, an organiza organization called Green Card Voices, and you saw many of those faces as you came into the lobby. I want to invite to the stage tonight Zainab Abdi. Hi everyone, <laughs> it's weekend. <laughs> My name is Zainab Abdi, and I came from Yemen. It's in, in the Middle East, and it's a beautiful country. I lived in a small city called Aden. I lived with my grandma, and my story today is about my grandma. And I usually, I never tell a story about my grandma because I love her so much, and I don't know how many hours it's gonna take me to tell her story. <laughs> I grew up with my grandma, me and my sister. I didn't grow up with my mom or my dad. And my mom, she was here in the United States for over almost now 18 years. And I grew up with my grandma and she was my mom, my dad, my friend, my family, everything. And I know some of you have a grandma that you love. <coughs> my grandma, she has been experiencing a lot of things just to make us happy. And as a young child, I didn't know that the thing that she had gone through, all I was seeing just had a smile and trying her best to give us what we need so we, we have the chance to have everything that other children have. Every time I was listening to her stories before I go to sleep, I love it a lot. And sometimes she calls me, saying I wake up school so I don't um, be late from school. Sometimes also on the weekend she called me, wake up at school, and there is no school. <laughs> she just wants me to help her with something, and she knows I'm gonna wake up. I still remember every single thing, the laugh, and everything that we had together, our stories, our memories. In 2010, when she died, I couldn't believe that she left us, and it was a sad moment for me and to my sister. My sister, she was younger to me, from me, two years. I had to take care of her. Me and my sister, we were in Yemen, trying to support each other. Then the revolution in Yemen started. And we had to flee from Yemen to Egypt to just run from a war. We had to leave everything behind, our pictures, our memories with our grandma. But we know that her soul is with us to protect us everywhere. We made it safe to Egypt, and we were waiting our process to come to the United States because my mom, she's a citizen, and she could bring us here. One day they call us, and they said, congratulations, they accept you. You have a visa to come to the United States. And I was so happy, but it was just for me, not for my sister. I had to leave my sister behind me, and I was like, you will come after us. I'm sure that they're gonna send your visa, it's on the way, it just is gonna take a long process. Then my sister had to wait one year and nothing changed. I came here to the United States and I saw my mom and I saw my sisters for the first time and it was amazing, but I left my other sister behind. I know from that time that I need to do something and I need to be a lawyer so other people that they want to immigrate to another place, they don't be separate from their family. We have many people that they moved from their home, they left their children, their sister, their wife, their parents, just to find a better life. And sometimes it doesn't worth it because family is everything. Home is everything that we need. Today my sister, she took her chance and she fled from Egypt to Europe through immigration routes through the ocean, and she made it safe, thanks God. Other people, they don't make it safe. They die in their journey. My sister now, she's married, she's in Belgium, she found someone she loves. But there's other stories that people die, people we don't know about them, we don't know where they land. If you know immigrants around you, Support them, because you never know where are the, the other half of them and if they're missing some people. Thank you.
Hello, everyone. My name is Luis Angel Santos Enriquez, and I am from El Salvador. Besides all the things that I suffer, I miss my small but beautiful El Salvador. At some point of my life, I knew that there was a possibility that I was going to come to the United States. It was exciting to know that, but I tried to ignore it. We have waited for so many years until we got the letter from, for the appointment at the U.S. Embassy. Months after that appointment, one day I came home. My dad had the passports in hand and told me that we were leaving the country in two weeks. At the time, I did not know if I should be happy or sad. In two weeks, I will have to leave everything that I love behind. I got into a stage of denial and told my dad that I did not want to come to the United States. My mom, with whom I've always been so close, was heartbroken and wanted me to stay with her, but at the same time, she wanted a better future for me. The three of us had a talk, and what my dad told me was just a hard reality. While you are here, with a great opportunity, going to the United States in an airplane without danger, there's thousands of people that died to get this opportunity. They suffer many horrible things, and now you're here telling me that you're going to waste this? Think about, your, think about your future and the things that you can accomplish there. This changed my mind. I just couldn't stop thinking about the people that have to die pursuing the American dream. We finally left El Salvador on, on June of 2012. Arriving to the United States was scary, but very exciting. I faced many challenges my first years in the country. Learning English was not simple. I struggled with my identity. I was seen as less than and humiliated by others because I did not know how to speak the language. I've been also called an illegal and many, or, and many more horrible things. I was bullied because of my sexual orientation, I th although it was not as much as when I was in El Salvador. With the time, I improved my English, got a job, and figured out my life. It's been five years since I got to the country, and I look back to the things that I have accomplished, and I still can't believe I was able to accomplish them. Currently, I am working on my associate's degree for human services in Minneapolis Community and Technical College, and I am, thank you. <laughs> and I am very fortunate, fortunate to be in this country which I love and call home, thank you.
Welcome to Sanctuary at the Ordway Concert Hall. My name is Christopher Tykelo, and I'm the executive director of One Voice Mixed Chorus. Thank you so much for spending your afternoon with us. I would like to invite you to stop by our table at the lobby to learn more about One Voice and how you can become involved, sign up to be on our mailing list, and register to win our latest CD, The Man Behind the Dream, which is also available for purchase. So please consider taking a little bit of One Voice home with you. Please support our mission of building community and creating social change by raising our voices in song, by making a financial gift to One Voice. In your concert program, you'll find an audience survey. Please fill that out so that we can learn more about our audiences and provide that information to our funders. In your program, you'll also find lots of great information about ways to help our new immigrant neighbors and friends feel more welcome in our community and ways that you can get involved. I would also like to invite you to enjoy the visual display Green Card Voices has created and chart your own family's immigration in the lobby. Finally, if you enjoyed tonight's concert, please tell your friends and neighbors, and please come back and join us for Roots and Wings, 30 years of one voice mixed chorus here at the Ordway, June 23rd and 24th. Tickets are now on sale. Thanks again so much for being here. Enjoy the rest of the concert and bring on the Lumberjacks. When Minnesota became a state over 150 years ago, more than half its land was forest. The white pines were epic. They were often 200 feet tall and six feet wide. These pines fueled the lumber industry, which became the heart of the Minnesota economy. In 1901, as Teddy Roosevelt took office, there were 30,000 lumberjacks working in Minnesota forests. They were mostly European immigrants, sleeping two to a bunk and eating enormous breakfasts. Yes, they were powered by pancakes. Is it any wonder that two gay artists in the 1930s were captivated by the heroic lumberjack legend? librettist W.H. Auden and composer Benjamin Britten. Paul Bunyan was Britten's first operetta and incorporated a variety of American musical styles, including folk songs, hymns, and blues. In this scene, Bunyan has the task of choosing a foreman from his hearty crew of immigrant lumberjacks. <laughs> Welcome, and settle down. We have no time to waste. The trees are waiting for the ax, and we must all make haste. So, who shall be the foreman to set in hand the work, to organize the logging, and see folks do not shirk? Cross, cross, Halsa. The Andy Anderson. Andy Anderson. In your opinion, which of you, which one would be the best to be the leader of the crew and govern all the rest? I, I, who, you. This was in Sweden, it's a very long way off. My appetite was hearty, but I couldn't get enough. Then suddenly I heard a roar across the white blue sea. I'll give you steak and onions if you come and work for me. <laughs> In 
in France I wooed a maiden with an alabaster skin But she left me for a fancy chef who played the violin When just about to drown myself a voice came from the sky There's no one like a lumber shark to catch a maiden's eye Long ago in Germany, while sitting at my ease, there came a knocking at my door, and it was the police. I tiptoed down to back stairs, and a voice to me did say, There's freedom in the forest out in North America. <laughs>
November 8th, 2017 was a historic election day. A record six transgender candidates were elected to office across the country. <laughs> Woo! Yes. And in Minneapolis, two transgender candidates took seats on the city council as Philippe Cunningham defeated a 20-year incumbent and Andrea Jenkins captured more than 70% of the vote to represent our eighth ward. It was, it was a night of new hope for our community, yes. But also in November, the names of 25 transgender U.S. citizens killed in 2017 were read aloud as part of the International Transgender Day of Remembrance. 2017 was the deadliest year on record for trans people, and most of those murdered were trans women of color. Unlike Minnesota, most states do not have laws prohibiting discrimination against transgender and gender non-binary people. Indeed, in many states, anti-transgender bias is systematically enforced in nearly all aspects of life, including in laws, schools, housing, healthcare, and employment. And even with legal rights in Minnesota, bias and violence against transgender and gender non-binary individuals is widespread. Now, more than ever, it is important to stand with transgender and non-binary members of our community to celebrate trans beauty, strength, and resilience and to engage in political actions to fight the tide of hatred. The triumphs of the November 8th election provide a glimmer of hope for when we stand together and create communities of sanctuary. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad
So our Somali neighbors are the second largest group of foreign-born Minnesotans today. <laughs> and Somali Etoso, or Somalia Wake Up, uh, was their national anthem until 2012. So I thought that y'all ought to learn it and sing it. So that when you're walking down the street, you can sing it to a Somali neighbor. I know, I see a few drop, drop jaws, but <clears throat> the words are in your program on the main page, and I'm going to teach them to you. So repeat after me, Somalie, Doso, Doso, Isku, Tir Sadae, Hadbakina, Tog Darane. Let's do that one again, Hadbakina. Tagdarane, Tagera, Waligine. You got it memorized? All right, perfect. Here's your starting pitch. We're going to sing a line and you sing it back. Here we go. And now, since it's the national anthem, you will all stand to sing. The Ojibwe people arrived in Minnesota around the 1500s, traveling along the Great Lakes from the East Coast. According to prophecy, they traveled until they reached a land where food grows on water, manomen, the good grain, wild rice. 300 years later, European immigrants moved westward, changing forever the lives of the Ojibwe people. An 1837 treaty with the Ojibwa opened a large part of Minnesota to logging. Trees were harvested to build log houses and raise crops, destroying many Minnesota forests. The influx of non-native people into Minnesota was devastating to the Ojibwe, my mother's people. The tribe went from being a regional power to occupying a small area of their original homeland, but with rights to hunt, gather, and harvest wild rice in the ceded territories. The same treaty is now being contested over hunting and fishing rights, while Minnesota lakes and rivers suffer from contamination and pollution. 40% of Minnesota's water is impaired by farm runoff, bacteria, mercury, and other pollutants. This fall, we had the honor of learning the Nibe water song from Sharon Day 
an Ojibwe grandmother and water protector through her mater maternal lineage. She described the role of women as life givers and water protectors in the Ojibwe tradition. Sharon's Nibe walks are focused in faith, faith in the water spirits, faith in the earth, faith in humankind, and faith in the power of love. She encouraged us and everyone to sing this song every day for the water. Today we are blessing water that has been gathered from across the world. The song says, water, we love you. We thank you. We respect you. Last night I had a dream. A dream I, I saw, saw all the people dancing in the street. They were all holding hands and moving their feet. They were dancing, they were moving to the rhythm of the beat. They were swinging, they were grooving to, to the rhythm to of the dancing move. To the rhythm of the swing and groove. To the rhythm a multitude. To the rhythm of the beat, ba ba, do buddy ba ba, do mamas and daddies, sisters and brothers, grandmas and grandpas, cousins, uncles and aunts. They were all holding hands and moving their feet. They were dancing, they were moving to the rhythm of the beat. They were swinging, they were grooving to the rhythm of the dance and move. To the rhythm of the swing and groove. To the rhythm, don't need no shoes. No need shoes. To the rhythm of the beat. Ba, ba. Do, buddy, ba, ba. The people were dancing across the land. From Indonesia to Kenya, from Peru to Japan. They were all holding hands and moving their feet. They were dancing, they were moving to the rhythm of the beat. They were swinging, they were grooving to, to the rhythm of the dance and move. To the rhythm of the swing and move. They were dancing, they were moving, they were grooving to the rhythm. This morning, step. 
stepped into the street. There was nobody dancing, no one moving their feet. I held out my hand, a stranger to greet. Soon two were dancing, two were moving to the rhythm of the beat. Then four were dancing, four were moving to the rhythm of the beat. Then four were dancing, four were moving. People across the land were joining their hands and dancing to the rhythm of the dance and move, to the rhythm of the swing and groove, to the rhythm, me and you, to the rhythm of the beat. Many LGBT folks have their own sanctuary stories, and I am one of them. My name is Anna, and I was raised in a very religious and conservative home. My life was centered around church. That is where my friends were, where I got to sing, where all my surrogate parents were. I loved the community of church. I didn't really know what gay was, just that some people were gay and that they were bad people. In high school, I joined choir and theater, it was there that I met gay people for the first time and realized that, huh, they're just people, not bad people. Conversations with my gay friends led me to come out just in time to take a girl to senior prom. But I still couldn't tell my parents. I was often depressed and anxious that they would find out and I would lose my family. I went to college, majored in theater, and fell majorly in love. This was the real deal and I was so damn happy. I had to come out to my family. But when I told my mom, she kind of fell apart and said, you are not my daughter. This is not who God created you to be. And with that, I lost my family. And by extension, the church community that I loved so much, why me? people I have journeyed far from them my mother and I are two of a kind and I wear my father's face but I have left them 
In 1975, J. Vang, a Hmong Laotian, along with several thousand other Hmong, found himself with a target on his back. The Army of the People's Republic of Vietnam had invaded Laos and were intent on punishing by death the Hmong who had been recruited by the American CIA to serve in the secret army of Laos. Jay barely escaped to a refugee camp and in the early 1980s came to Lincoln, Nebraska, where I and members of my church were his sponsors. We felt great. Our church had found Jay a well-paying job with benefits and housing with a Vietnamese grad student. But from Jay's perspective, things were not so rosy. He was the only Hmong in all of Lincoln, as far as we could tell. As his sponsors, we were oblivious to the fact that hostilities between Vietnam and Hmong uh, were the reason he was here in the first place, and he was living with someone from Vietnam. Jay disappeared one day in January, leaving behind his green card, his ID, and his paperwork that said he was a legal immigrant. His roommate said that Jay purchased a bus ticket to Minneapolis, where, among, <coughs> where many other Hmong had already immigrated. Imagine the reunion that Jay experienced when, after nearly 10 years, he found his community, people who looked like him, talked like him, and cooked like him. Now, Jay did not leave us without gratitude, however. On Valentine's Day, one of the women on our team received a huge valentine. The card said, Dear Mom, Happy Valentine's Day. And then in Jay's own handwriting, Love you forever, Jay Vang.
Finding who you are is something that takes a lot of time for some of us. I always knew that I was different, but I couldn't express myself. I struggled for many years trying to find my identity. When I finally thought I was sure about who I was, I told my sister, she was very supportive. I was actually very scared to talk to my family about this. I was just 12. One day, I decided that my mom needed to know. I wanted to share the real me with her. It did not turn well. She took me to church, tried to talk me out of it, because all this was just 30 thoughts. And she had faith that I was going to change. Honestly, I don't blame her for her reaction. As she said, she did not have any education about the gay community. And all she knew was that society rejected us. I was sent with my dad to work and try to learn things that men do. At this point, I never shared who I was with my dad, but he always argued with me because I did not behave like a man. They were trying to change me, to erase my identity, and to make a new person out of me. I started to hate myself, and I felt so miserable that I wanted to kill myself. Things did improve with the time, but this was mostly because my mother found out I was going to leave the country. She told me that she accepts me accepts me and loved me no matter what because I was her son and nothing will change that. When I came to the United States, I came only with my dad. Our relationship was not the best. We argued about me and my style. He was never happy with what I wore, the way I walked or laughed. If I cried, it was not okay because men don't cry. He had this mentality of a macho man. I was always scared that he was going to hurt me or kick me out of the house. In 2015, I started dating a wonderful man whom I love very much. For my high school graduation, he was introduced as a friend to my dad. I was so nervous because I knew I couldn't fool my dad, but I tried. Days later, the question that came up from him was, what type of relationship do you have with your friend? I struggled and I stayed silent for a little, and I took a deep breath and I told him that it was time for him to know that he was not my friend, that he was my boyfriend. I felt something that I cannot describe. I felt free of fear. He did not take it well, and we did not speak for months. It was painful, but I knew that things were going to get better between us. With the time, I started noticing that my dad wasn't feeling good, not having conversations with me. We discussed the topic, and I told him that I was sorry, but I will never change, and I will stay with my boyfriend because I love him. The change I have seen in my dad has shocked me. I know that I can freely speak about my relationship in my life with my family, and they will not have a negative reaction. At this point of my life, I am completely free of keeping the secret of who I am. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> un lugar, un hogar, nuestro hogar, un lugar que podemos llamar el nuestro, hacer el nuestro, un lugar para vivir, crecer y ser, un pedazo de lo nuestro que compartimos con el mundo, un trozo de nuestros corazones que traemos a la comunidad, un mundo de consuelo y un mundo de calma. Un mundo de amor.
Thank you. If this concert spoke to you, I invite you to check out the program. There are action steps. Uh, go home, read through them. You can also go to the One Voice website, and I put the same action steps there with all kinds of links and ways you can get involved in your community uh, and, and support these kinds of issues. In 2018, speak out against hate. Speak out against hate in Minnesota and take action in support of your immigrant neighbors. Have you ever felt like nobody was there? Have you ever felt forgotten in the middle of nowhere? Have you ever felt like you could disappear? Like you could fall and no one would hear? So let that lonely feeling wash away Cause maybe there's a reason to believe you'll be okay Cause when you don't feel strong enough to stand You can reach, reach out your hand years and I'm living with my girlfriend, still stupidly happy, but something was missing, a community. I turned to Google and after filtering out LGBT groups that weren't bars or sports, I found One Voice's website. What? A choir of gay people? Yes, please. It took me a year to work up the courage to audition and boy am I glad I did. This is home. This is the music my soul needed. The friendships I found here have profoundly changed my life. The education and programming gave my wife and I the language to talk about gender identity. And you, you all gave me the spiritual stability and confidence to not give up on my family. It took six years, but now my wife is a welcome member of the family. Like many immigrants to Minnesota, I know what it feels like to not be welcome in my own community, to be separated from everything that had been my home. Thank you, friends, for being my sanctuary. Someone will come running